Aurora CUI aims to provide a global student mentoring platform. Whether it's academic subjects, locations, or interests, our algorithm provides curated one-on-one -on -one matches between high school mentees and university mentors. With a pre-launch presence of mentors from some of the world's best universities, Aurora CUI aims to connect students on an international level. You can sign up to either be a mentee or a mentor at auracui.com. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another uh, episode of Insights with Experts. So today we're really lucky to have Mr. Chi Huang Xia. And so uh, he's, he's a very well-decorated um, architect and, and he's been in architecture for decades now. Former president of the Singapore Institute of Architects and to be CEO of DP Architects. Welcome and how are you? Yes. I think Mr. Xiao's connection has cut out. We are back. Hi. Um, so, Sorry. Uh, yeah, guys how are you? Well. Okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> good, good. So, That's great. Yeah. Um, right. So, uh, I'll, I'll get started. I'll go straight into, into the questions. Um, the first sort of question was, you know, what inspired you to go into architecture? Was it always on your mind? Was it always an interest or a hobby in the background? You know, and also maybe could you tell us a little bit about what your role as CEO might entail at DP? Okay, sure. So, uh, in, thank you for arranging this conversation with all of you. Uh, and yeah. It's really a pleasure to share with all of you a bit of my journey into uh, the profession and, and how my encounter of architecture has been and, and hopefully will eventually evolve. Uh, your first question was about what inspired me to go into architecture. I will start off with, uh, I'll say maybe uh, since young, at least um, of uh, that keen interest uh, in, in art. And I have to thank my mom for it. So there is a bit of a story there. Uh, because since young, I've always been kind of quite keen in terms of art, painting. And, and they brought me uh, and given me this opportunity to acquire at least uh, this love, passion, and of course comes with that, the, the skill set. And um, I think that is something that kind of uh, started to engineer a certain process of appreciation. But I would say the next factor will be uh, the part about uh, context uh, where I grew up. So my growing up was in a humble Singaporean household. Uh, some of you, since you're in Singapore or near Singapore, uh, may, may be aware. Uh, and I, I recall, you know, it was this uh, our HDB public housing uh, and I had the chance to live uh, across three different HDB household and neighborhoods. First was with my parents, my, uh, so my grandparents, my parents, and then eventually my own. I think that uh, context of how I grew up uh, probably made me more acute and drawn to the notion of uh, setting. Uh, it has also developed certain uh, sensitivity towards things like uh, the community space, public-private uh, design issues that are more socially inclined. And um, I, I share the other aspects of uh, my other passion is, uh, is in sports. Uh, I play competitive basketball, as I shared, since the age of, of 12. And to some, I do not know, uh, at least this whole uh, idea of passion and drive together with the arts. Somehow architecture just becomes a key and natural draw for me. And that's how I chance upon and decided to make that, that plunge into, into this space, which I think, yeah, has uh, really changed my life. Yeah. Uh, next part in terms of question that uh, you raised was about uh, the role of uh, CEO. So just to qualify, I'm still, uh, I'm the deputy CEO of, of DP. Uh, maybe I will share about uh, the, the synergy with uh, at least the role of uh, the CEO. 
And for DP, uh, the CEO is responsible uh, simply for the overall success of the organization. <clears throat> and it's about making top managerial decisions, realizing the firm's uh, business visions and objectives. It's about uh, creating, planning, implementation and integrating these strategic directions into uh, the approach of the firm. Uh, I think with that, it kind of percolates into how the entire organization and group is set up in structure. And of course, following that, the kind of system that helps to support uh, our structure and organization. Yeah, I would say, but one of the key part in terms of CEO ship in again, the context of an uh, architectural and a design practice is uh, the very important component in at least for DP or a CEO is the part on design. So in addition to the executive role, because all our directors are actually uh, working directors. So it's not just pure executive and administrative position that we play. We are also leaders in the architectural practice because we feel that there's an imperative and a need to lead by example. So you can't be motivating or giving directions when you don't know what's happening in, in our landscape of practice. And, and for us to uphold the highest standards of design, of design thinking that the firm can produce, we must be part of that drivers to push for that change. And in the setting of DP, uh, we are guided by three key uh, strategic thrusts. So first, just use the, num uh, the name DP. So our D uh, effectively means design. So our first thrust is about this idea of design first. And it's, it's really about us being the steward of built environment and, and how we can harness capacity of design through identifying key champions and drivers. And then with that, form the uh, knowledge base uh, in, and in today's context, idea of data database to drive uh, discourse, discussions, and uh, find most effective tool. And again, in, in today's day and age, it's about how we look at technology and digitalization uh, or digitalized process to allow us to develop more innovative, sustainable, and purposeful design solution. The part, the second thrust is that of uh, the next letter P, and is about partnership. And in DP's uh, kind of context, we define it as peoples and partners. That is us recognizing our chief capital as in our people, uh, in terms of human capital, in terms of intellectual capital. And this is uh, leveraging on the power of we in terms of concept of the team. So in a firm of this organization, I think my earlier experience of uh, how we operate in the team in terms of uh, again, the setting of, of sports, uh, I see huge synergy uh, and, and learnings from there. And by centering the firm on the development of people and, and really looking at the capacity of what the team can bring, it allows us to really reach uh, broad uh, breadth as well as uh, the depth in terms of our uh, capabilities and even potential. And then the last thrust is this idea of one global studio. Uh, and that is uh, really our strategy when it comes to internationalization and growth. And this is uh, where we tap on our collective strength of talents uh, worldwide across culture to export and exchange expertise to generate innovative but yet contextual solution to serve needs of community worldwide. Um, and moving forward, I think one of the key part, at least in areas of focus in what we see in the immediate horizon is uh, areas of uh, sustainability. I think, again, as part of the design a community, this idea of how do we respond to uh, critical and very topical subjects of climate change, sustainability has to be center of uh, our kind of design practice. Next is on wellness and place. I think there's a question about what uh, and how COVID has changed uh, architecture. And I think it's not just architecture, but in fact, the entire uh, global society. And is this whole shift from wealth to health 
So the idea of wellness and place is, is quite key on one of our other uh, agenda in terms of uh, uh, deepening our design capacity. Last but not least is really through enablers like digital and technological tools, how can it allow us to further propagate this aspiration? Yeah, sorry, that's a very long answer to your short question. But I hope no, no, it's, that it's, it's great. Yeah, no, no, I think it, it's a really good answer and, it, and it's good to be um, sort of thorough. And I think uh, lots of people will enjoy sort of listening um, and learning a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, of, cool. Of course. I mean, one of the main things that I got from that is it's not, it's not an easy task, is it? I mean, it sounds like you have a lot going on. There are many commitments which you have and these choices that you, you make in this, in this company, it's not just choices that affect you, it's choices that really affect everyone. And that leads nice mm -hmm. on, to, on to this next question, which uh, I would like, like to ask. And that essentially revolves around the amount of commitments that you have on. Now, as somebody in a leadership role such as yours, you've got many things flying around, many commitments that you, you have to turn to. And many students can feel that exact same way whether they've got numerous exams on, numerous sport commitments that they have, outside of school commitments, what advice would you give to students in terms of how to cope with all of these commitments that are happening based on how you would currently cope with them as of now? Hmm. Uh, I want to be honest here, all right? Uh, because you talk about how do I juggle the different commitment, the term struggle comes into picture. Because if I were to tell you I can do all this on my own, that's, I'm not sure whether I can say that, that's BS. And we all know it, we all know it. And this is where earlier I talked about uh, the value of and the power of teamwork. And you know, a very important aspects of how I'm able to do what I'm doing. It's really leveraging on uh, a very strong uh, uh, talent base and very key team participation to allow me to be a lot more effective in my role. So it's really important I mean, coming to the idea of, uh, of forming the team with shared visions and how collectively we can achieve uh, the goals that they set out. It's important in terms of especially in the capacity of such of our, of our leadership to support uh, one another in developing skill set in competency uh, again the idea of the play of uh, the team approach to minimize gaps overlaps and to allow us to kind of really amplify our strength and it's also about building a culture of, of no fear in terms of speaking up, in terms of having discussion, in terms of how do we generate discourse uh, in order for us to find uh, the most effective and appropriate solution. And um, I, I shared, uh, that's really a part of uh, DP's culture in terms of the power of we, because we do have highly, uh, not just competent, but very dedicated staff and people across uh, the, different, the different ranks. And then, you know, with the good team in place, it opens up space for me to prioritize the different responsibility. And in that sense, I will be able to better prioritize amongst this whole list of priority. So the idea of team is key. The second, I would say key, at least drivers that allow me to continue to pursue uh, uh, all these uh, key uh, so-called tasks and the various challenge. It really boils down, down back to passion. Uh, I would say I'm probably the, the fortunate ones, or the few fortunate ones, that I'm actually doing what I love and I actually love what I'm doing. And the, the combination of these two, uh, at least on a personal level, it's, it's really uh, the machine that helps me to take on tasks, challenges uh, with strength and optimism. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, this is uh, at least how I stay sane to some extent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you, I wanted to as well, um, you know, in, in start, you also told us you're quite a person who's actually in, into sport. 
But I don't think, I think even if you didn't say that as well, that's something we could kind of infer. And I like how you talk about playing as a team, being as a team player, because as good as even in sport, as good as any player is, as good as Ronaldo is, playing on his own, he's useless in fact. Every team has their specific players, which has a specific role. I really like the fact that you talk about that in your firm as well. That, that actually leads on very nicely to the next question, which we would like to ask. I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned earlier, which was about keeping your team motivated and having people to buy in. So my question would be, for students who are in team-based project works, then how do you get buy people to buy in and to believe in the same goal and to work towards the same mission? Mm. Uh, I, I will go back to that keyword about purpose. And I think it's, again, something highly relevant uh, with, uh, with our line of works and in fact with this vocation of architecture because in through aligning with DP's legacy uh, we all recognize that <clears throat> this is not just about a business there's a connection and what we do actually shapes lives you know of the people of the communities that we design buildings for the spaces that uh, people gather and, and interact and bond. So it's important uh, that we aspire to always elevate ourselves and to be the best that we can and lead us in design and innovation. So I think setting purpose is key because through understanding purpose with that alignment, you're willing to come together to identify uh, with that shared outcomes and goals. Uh, and then of course, through that, that's where uh, the concept of team make, of recognizing each and everyone's role. I think like what Sham said, so they didn't say the space of uh, say a football team. You will know that someone needs to be uh, the one moving forward in terms of uh, offensive role, going for the goals. But at the same time, uh, the midfield plays their roles in covering uh, that kind of mid zone while we have the defenders and the goalkeepers. So it's, it's allowing each and every team members to understand what are the values they can bring to the table. And for good leaders, uh, it's also important to be aware of uh, the need for, say, whether it's about rotational basis so that everybody has a chance to experience. And or if not in specific circumstances or situations, articulate why specific team members are playing specific roles so that uh, there's that mutual recognition and again uh, moving towards a uh, common or shared goal and in terms of uh, motivating not just team members but also uh, our our staff uh, at work to live up to their maximum uh, kind of potential uh, i would say from the most pragmatic uh, basis uh, is to work towards a weighted reward uh, system that is kind of a benchmark on performance and very important thing on potential because there are tangible qualities that we recognize that can be articulated but we all know there's always this aspects of the intangible and uh, that's one way we can find more equitable means and measures to provide the right kind of motivations uh, and to allow space for progression. So that ties in with uh, a kind of robust uh, system of talent management and succession plan. So again, uh, identifying intrinsic talents early for training and how they grow in the firm, but uh, also giving our people a sense of validation in terms of the skill and competency uh, and recognize contributions that they make across ranks. And I think it's very important that so that you're constantly reminded that everybody has a part uh, in this uh, bigger success that we can all aim towards. And in the context of DP, one of our uh, uh, very strategic uh, vehicle in terms of, I would say, uh, quite strategic idea of motivation and growth, it's our DP Academy. So our academy is set up, I think, uh, in 2016. And uh, this instrument allows us to develop a framework that 
uh, meaningfully develop skills and competency uh, and curate almost like a kind of uh, career long learning journey for all members, again, across vaccination experience and role. Because uh, from a design practice perspective, as I mentioned earlier, our key assets are our people and the kind of uh, skill set and the intellectual capital. And one of the best way uh, to grow them is through continuous and at least a structure or a structured way of uh, upskilling, maintaining their relevance. And since 2016, we developed a comprehensive learning and development kind of platform with calendar across office. There's regular uh, courses, training that touch on a spectrum of uh, topics. And on top of uh, this idea of training and management, so initiative like uh, learning credits and prudential, and, and uh, we have a new uh, DP Academy portal that's all set up uh, during uh, the pandemic period, which, which encourage individual ownership and empowerment of, of shaping their own kind of uh, learning process, be it on a specific time, the space that they need, the kind of courses uh, that they hope to upgrade themselves, but all relevant to where we see the practice is moving. And this presents the key steps uh, that goes beyond attending just more of the institutional mandatory course. I think with that, this is, um, I will say some of the examples of how we, we motivate our team members and our staff. Very long answer, so sorry about it. I just realized it's quite weird with a room full of, uh, or the check room full of uh, people and I, I end up keep talking. All right, so you guys got to chip in a little yeah. bit more. No, no. I mean, I think actually those answers, they're really important to sort of um, put out. And, and I think they were um, very sort of well um, put out and very eloquently sort of stated. Um, moving on, though, it's sort of our next those section kind of, yeah. um, is uh, where we have a guest student um, and we have them ask their questions to you sort of about the career path and and uh, whatnot. So um, today we have Jay Chu, who's uh, an architecture student. Uh, Jay, how are you? Introduce okay. yourself quickly. Um, so I'm Jay. I'm currently in uh, University of Cambridge studying architecture. I'm in my second year and yeah, very excited to be here. Hi, Jay. Um, hello. <laughs> um, so should I get on to questions then? Um, yes, please. So you were saying um, that uh, DP has sort of like a large wealth of architects and uh, sort of like constituent parts sort of working towards um, an angle. I was wondering if as an individual architect working in a big firm like DP, do you feel like the creativity of individual architects is limited in a sense, working in a sort of like large multinational firm? Or do you think that individual creativity can still flourish in a setting like that? Hmm. So, uh... I think, thanks for the question, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, being in a, a, a large kind of uh, practice uh, almost all my life, I shared earlier when I was with Fosters and Partners and now, now with uh, a DP, I, and they both uh, are in say, uh, at least in the context of profession, large practices. Uh, I don't see at least the stifling of creativity. And in fact, what is uh, uh, quite key here, at least in terms of the advantage of skill, is the breadth of what, uh, say, I use DP as the context is offer, at least my, for myself for the past 17 years. Because of the skill, there's a whole breadth of uh, building types, typologies, and market that DP is able to reach, all right? And of course, uh, with 53 years of legacy, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience that has been gained. There's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a deep knowledge base that's been built. And, you know, in order for us to innovate, you need to know what were precedents, what were earlier bases. So we know what are the issues and uh, the specific aspects uh, of, of the topic that we are either challenging or trying to uh, transcend. I think this is uh, quite key. And uh, given 
And what is also quite unique in a larger practice setup is the dynamics beyond just, uh, say, uh, on, say, design issues or to some extent, say, on, on discussions of aesthetics and beauty. You know that the complexity of economics, maybe social, political issues, commercialization, larger discussion of sustainability becomes the layers uh, that shapes the environment. So to some extent, it helps me, at least personally, to be uh, even more open-minded, to have a broad perspective. And what is unique about our per particular profession, given all these uh, issues, the, the dynamics, we still need to translate and synthesize them into a physical space, uh, details, features, uh, for uh, the community or pe for people to use uh, and to inhabit. So uh, that's where a large part of that uh, innovation and creativity can be applied. And I'll say that this term of, uh, uh, of how creative process um, can be kind of generated, there's also a part that is quite self-driven. And, uh, and uh, I would say a precursor to that is to, to also look at subjects with open mind and look at opportunities that lie within. Something could be highly banal or mundane, but if you are optimistic in terms of opportunities for learning, I think that's uh, an effective key step for us to at least start the creative process. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because I've, I've spoken to an architect before and I think he described the industry as he used the sort of like an uh, analogy of creative, uh, creative um, analogy for creativity as like a cup of water and like you sort of go into the industry and the industry takes out of that cup. So like he's sort of saying that <laughs> you, slowly, you sort of slowly lose your creativity throughout your career in the industry. So that's why I was wondering like how can sort of like individual architects working in big firms sort of like will they lose themselves basically like working too long mm. in a big, big firm like, or would they sort of like conform to sort of like the general sort of vision of the company rather than their own so um so that was really just but jay, jay but jay can i also just chip in i mean take it as a more kind of conversational oh. format to sorry yeah. to interrupt you uh i would say one of the other uh, aspects about dp i'm not completely sure that's common in most large practice or you know there's still a limit in terms of this idea of size of a team because regardless of how large uh, say a firm is uh, the idea of working on a project is you know that one of your smallest uh, denominator besides team members is uh, the size of the team all right and and hence from a team-based perspective, that itself already allows you, or at least in our environment, we give quite a fair bit of autonomy and elbow space for each of the team and team lead to drive a specific uh, process or approach to project. So even within a setup, uh, if there are trust and empowerment, you can still allow certain individualism and maybe associated with that creative process to take place. The other aspects that, at least personally, uh, where I'm, I benefited a lot from it is uh, also through DP, I was introduced to the Singapore Institute of Architects. Again, this is the other capacity that allows me to understand beyond uh, the space of my own practice, say DP Architects, about the other aspects of uh, our professional landscape. So with the Institute, I'm exposed to a range of practice. Again, I see how some of the, the, the smaller uh, kind of creative practices, the kind of operation, the projects that they do uh, to mid-sized firm, uh, again, the range and the depth. So that itself, again, allows me uh, the opportunity to continue to also learn in my own capacity, but of course, through uh, opportunities that has been uh, given with working with this organization. Yeah. 
would you say that's something that sort of like all firms just try and adapt to, to sort of like, is, is that setup that becomes like perhaps normal boss or perhaps and big or just to try and adapt, like trying to sort of like encourage individual creativity rather than having this overarching sort of like, you know, hierarchy to design. Because um, have you, mm. you having worked in non bus you would probably know how, how the other setup compares to DP, for example. Yeah. So uh, probably, um, pro probably not the best person to advise how other firms should kind of run. But I would say it's slightly different, uh, especially when you have a firm that started with a specific persona. All right, uh, there's an identity because you know it's called Fosters and Partners. So uh, in, in this case, clearly, uh, Lord Fosters, he was the protagonist behind the practice. And then with that, it's also the kind of uh, values and the principles uh, when it comes to the practice of architecture that many embrace, which is why they gather and work together with him. That's how that's formed. But what is very interesting is that uh, with Fosters, and we know uh, that there's a whole tran uh, transformation and transitions of new leaders. Well, Sorry, I think uh, I lost you guys there for a while. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm not sure where you last heard <laughs> which, which <laughs> part did I stop. Probably at uh, the part that uh, where, where there is already a transition in terms of leadership yeah. responses, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting to see that the firm continue to embrace some of this. Uh, core values that has already uh, permeated as uh, the, the organizational level of values and the leaders in place continue to embrace them but through maybe more of their original and unique setup they, they allow each of these clusters uh, to continue to generate innovations and ideas and I think they are doing pretty well so it is still possible uh, I think just to go back to your earlier question, that uh, the skill of setup does not necessarily mean that it works against uh, a creative process. Uh, it's really uh, uh, how, uh, in terms of setup, organizational culture, uh, and the kind of leadership that's in place uh, that celebrates uh, such values and uh, such positive outcomes. So um, what do you think the difference is for working for Fosters compared to working for DP? So because working in different countries and working under different regulations, do you, do you find that transition easy? Because I'm thinking working in the UK for a while before, before eventually going back to Malaysia or, you know, going home. So do you find the transition easy or do you like, has your perspective changed, like moving from one country to another? Wow. Well, uh... <clears throat> It's interesting, I have to share. The, the last time I was in UK was uh, 2000, year 2000. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> so, I mean, my, at least my experience uh, or with, in terms of the immersion of that, that culture or that practice, uh, I would say compared to what is it now, I'm quite sure it's, it, things may have changed and it's very different. Um, but uh, again, my point about at least the, the comparison between Fosters and DP, uh, I, I see more of similarities to, to some extent. Obviously, uh, in terms of context of, of operation of practice, uh, I would say probably Fosters is a lot more Eurocentric, given the kind of uh, where the practice is located. And then for DP, it's very much uh, uh, Asian or ASEAN centric. All right. I think, uh, and, and I would say both practice and, and organization 
has quite effectively harnessed uh, advantage of this strategic uh, kind of uh, geographical location, say in the UK and in London, versus in BP of us uh, in Singapore to allow us to kind of uh, export our services uh, across the immediate region and uh, to other parts of the world. So in similar like for BP, we started in Singapore as a home a homegrown practice, like I said, 53 years ago, and and kind of made quite uh, very intentional growth in terms of regionalization and a later internationalization about 20 years ago, thereabouts, or, or, or even uh, longer than that, and started to venture uh, overseas. And again, key thing that both firms put on the table are the kind of uh, values, uh, design preposition, the value preposition that we offer. And uh, my personal belief is for us to grow, and especially on this term of internationalize, you have to do it via innovation because you have to bring something different to the table for be it clients, communities uh, that are not uh, in, in a kind of uh, foreign context to embrace and welcome you. And, and to that light, there's a lot that we are still learning with uh, from practice like, like Foster's that have uh, always shown how in uh, organization, organization of that scale, they continue to reach new heights to reinvent themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so I think moving on to question, um, I was wondering, because over the summer there was the um, Reba election to, uh, for the president, and yeah. you've been the president of the Singapore Institute of Architects, and some people were asking um, whether Reba is still necessary and what, how, like, how, how do they contribute to the field of architecture? So as a former president of uh, SIA, how do you think institutions uh, sort of like this overarching like hierarchy institutions, like how do they contribute to the field of architecture and how can they sort of like further the field of architecture? Well, uh, realize Jay's questions are all quite, quite loaded. <laughs> <laughs> it's like always comparing this idea of Reva with, with SIA, with UK and Singapore. <laughs> but um, uh, maybe speaking from the experience of uh, with with SIA, I shared. Um, uh, I was exposed to the institute uh, 15 years ago. I think one of my previous team leaders, he was uh, leading a committee in SIA. So and and he just uh, asked me to join him to look at uh, the project. And the project was uh, of uh, I think it was a Singapore Pavilion at the Sao Paulo Biennale, and that was 2005, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, really about 15 years ago. And then of course, uh, that is my foray into this entire um, uh, kind of uh, uh, institution of, of what SIA is all about. And I think the key role of SIA, like Riva, um, it's really the advocacy of the profession. It's it's a platform, it's one of the key channel to share with uh, not just the industry, but really our larger society and community about what, uh, what an architect does. And uh, in, in that light for SIA, uh, obviously there's a part on uh, championing excellence in architecture and, then, and uh, with the support to uh, ensure that this is also percolated in making Singapore one of the most or the shiniest city and most livable place uh, in the world. And a few key kind of thrusts in terms of how SIA uh, was set up. Uh, I think kudos to the earlier president and uh, it was uh, architect or Miss Rita So then she have kind of structured the entire uh, institute into these four key pillars of design, practice, uh, education, and, institu and institution. So obviously from the design perspective, it's uh, really 
about creating greater awareness and appreciation of the value of a sustainable approach and this idea of good design. So I think you were talking about um, encouraging good design. And... Yeah, so I was sharing the four yep. uh, so-called key pillars of SIA. So uh, obviously there is the design aspects about um, at least generating that awareness of, of the value of a sustainable design, of, of high quality design in terms of how it add values to the built environment. The second, in terms of practice, it's really advancing this theory of practice of architecture. And, and that's true support and reward of quality research and innovation. And third, uh, the, the aspects of education. And uh, this is really uh, going back to the idea of, of lifelong learning. I mean, it sounds kind of like a cliche, but it is quite key because it's about allowing us to continue to stay relevant and to maintain a high level of professionalism amongst architects to better serve uh, the people that we are designing spaces and buildings uh, for. And last but not least, uh, this idea of an institution, it's really what defines this collective, what we call SIA. And it's about uh, promoting and providing a, a kind of common template amongst architects and it's about uh, collective mm -hmm. visions of working towards a dignified and caring mm -hmm. profession. Again, upholding higher standards of codes and ethics in the way we practice. So very much that's, that's uh, uh, how, what, at least through the Institute, the, the kind of values uh, that, that we embrace. And uh, in my, the, during my term, uh, I was fortunate that we were also in a kind of a major a discussion about transformation. So uh, towards the end of 2016, uh, in, in Singapore, uh, our kind of our government actually issued uh, somewhat kind of challenge and a major national hypothesis, you know, in the concept of a idea of transformation in order for us to be more future ready of what are the impending challenges uh, to come. And this uh, idea of transformation cuts across all sectors of the economy. And of course, within uh, the space of uh, architecture reform, uh, within the construction and built environment sector. And one of the key vehicles of change is to map out our industry transformation map. So, and, and uh, during my term, I was uh, fortunate to be able to work uh, on this transformation map together with my council members, all other 19 uh, of us uh, supported by uh, different committees uh, to really identify what are issues that are facing our, uh, not just profession, but industry, uh, to look at the larger kind of ecosystem what are areas or uh, are pitfalls. Uh, and then from there, uh, also to look further into what are challenges to come, all right? And then uh, by identifying and mapping out some of these key challenges, uh, is for us to strategically look at how, what are the outcomes we hope to achieve given such kind of conditions, be it a current or the future, and uh, look across, say, what are our capabilities, skills, and competency profile, and identify the different gaps or even overlaps. Uh, and, and then hence, uh, work out what are the accelerator for us to move towards such kind of transformation. So that was really exciting, uh, at least uh, for me in terms of endeavor uh, during my capacity as the president of Singapore Institute of Architects. Yeah. Um, I suppose speaking of transformation and about the future, I think um, the other day I was in a city lecture and I think they were saying how about 70% of the world population will be uh, living in urban areas. So that's a lot of people living in the city. So I was wondering how sort of like architects around the world can perhaps look at the building typologies in Singapore and how they might be able to take reference from, from that and how they can sort of look at Singapore and learn how to build 
more people for a growing population because Singapore is about sort of like building compact, building efficient, and having so little land, which um, other countries will sort of like soon face the same problem, like having scarce sort of like resources to build from. Like, how do you think that architects around the world in the future can sort of look at Singapore and be like, how can we be influenced by this? Hmm. Uh, I think in, in that again context, I would say uh, for for Singapore or for uh, architects in Singapore, we are to some extent uh, fortunate that we've been given uh, an inherent challenge. So as you said earlier, uh, the scarcity of resources, especially uh, of land, uh, presents uh, to our country and people, one of the biggest physical and almost static uh, challenge because it's difficult to kind of grow land out of the blue. So that limited resources, but it also spur and inspire uh, innovations and in that sense, creativity to work mm -hmm. uh, against the odds of some of these challenges. Again, it goes back to the earlier point, and this is on national scale, Jay, that big uh, uptake and task and the organization of nation doesn't necessarily mean uh, the depth of creative process. And this is where um, uh, we recognize again the power of our people because we don't have uh, re natural resources like oil, uh, there is no kind of huge agricultural land within Singapore, slightly different from Malaysia. Joa is that uh, our neighbors that, that again, and all in many countries that are less with such abundance of, of resources. So we do recognize, and, and what's quite funny, uh, one of our earlier deputy prime minister, he said, we only have uh, rocks and granite rocks. So that's, uh, that's at least, um, and I mean, joke aside, uh, it's really uh, back to the idea of uh, our human capital. Uh, and, um, and that's, First, in terms of uh, understanding that, and of course, in this context, uh, that's where uh, architects can really play uh, the roles of, of architects. And uh, by recognizing uh, this inherent uh, challenge that we have on hand, I think that's where our built environment becomes quite key. And uh, if I use the word that in architectural uh, students, and, and of course, uh, many of the team members here will understand the, the concept of hypothesis. Okay, how, given this limited resource and land mass, can we create a, a, a kind of vibrant uh, city at the same time uh, look at how do we create sustainable and livable uh, spaces for our communities? So, again, that, I would say, again, credits to our founding others uh, and some of our key leaders uh, of their idea of grand vision and very strategic uh, development of our cityscape. And, and uh, the city itself becomes one of the best testament. And what you can learn from how, uh, say, 50, more than 50 years ago, say, from a kind of a fishing village or, or, uh, or, or no, not fishing village, that's uh, probably 200 years ago. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, from uh, post-independence of how in leaps and bounds uh, our city has grown, it's really quite phenomenal. And in specific design aspects, one key part is about how we manage and design our density. And uh, in uh, our public housing is a good example. So. Uh, say in the earlier uh, 60s of, of how it was originally set out to serve more utilitarian needs of housing people to eventually how the discussion within the space of public housing is about creating the most livable and uh, enjoyable and sustainable environment for our communities. So this is one key aspect of of learning and knowledge that uh, Singapore has gained, all right, in terms of how uh, we can bring the values that we can bring, not just for 
uh, Singaporeans, but also something that we can share with uh, the, the global kind of audience and nation. And this comes also with the other key aspects of higher order planning. And it's with uh, the courage to look beyond the current state of things and to anticipate uh, key shifts and changes. And it uh, again requires a huge uh, teamwork amongst partners and stakeholders where we synergize needs of, uh, of uh, unprecedented uh, outputs uh, and, and put in place certain level of adaptability and flexibility. Uh, so these are, are quite key strategies uh, in the way uh, we approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, how are, we, how are we doing on time? I don't want to take up too much um, of, uh, of time. Are we doing all right, Sean? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, I reckon, sorry, okay. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I uh, think the, the questions are sort of really interesting and, and it's good to sort of hear, yeah, no worries. Okay, sorry, yeah, uh, I was just checking. Um, so um, I have a couple more questions, but um, speaking about sort of like cities and how it serves the people, I sort of want to bring it down to like a smaller scale. So I've looked at some of your, uh, some of the DP's projects on sort of like community centers um, and uh, sports centers. And I was wondering what role does an architect have to play in designing sort of like these spaces for the communities? And especially if they're not part of those communities, like how can someone that is not part of that context be able to design something that's enjoyable and sort of like that can serve uh, the people in that community? Mm. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's an area that, what's the right expression? That's uh, in my alley. <laughs> because I've been working on a, a fair bit of uh, community projects uh, uh, in Singapore, I think for almost the past uh, decade or so. So a specific typology that uh, myself and my team members have been working on is uh, this typology of integrated community development. And it's a kind of a typology that has emerged over the past decades. Some of the example, and and I'll say the Singapore Sports Hub is uh, one of the earliest version of, of, of how, again, an attitude towards a land resource where uh, it's not about a singular use that probably is relevant at a certain hour, at a certain time. It's about bringing different components and entity, curating that mix uh, in order to not just talk about uh, generating certain optimization of land use, but uh, synergizing and synthesizing uh, programs, you create synergies, shared spaces to allow uh, different facets of our community to come together. So from Sports Hub, I think that was, uh, we started the project, say, uh, 2006, 2007, uh, all the way to uh, and completed it, I think, 2015. And then from there, uh, our Tampanese hub, again, the first and largest integrated community hub. Uh, and then, of course, with that, there's a whole other arrays within the, uh, I mean, because if I state names like Bukit Canberra, it would be a bit abstract, but uh, other aspects of Singapore. So we are working on about four of these integrated community hub. So one aspects this uh, community space champion the optimization of space through how you intensify land. So that's why I said that unique approach to look at density. But importantly, it's not just about packing everything together, but be very purposeful in terms of who you bring in and what you bring in that, uh, that will help kind of generate uh, a new outcome. I mean, this idea of one plus one is, is more than two. So within a space or a plot of land itself, uh, you create this uh, approach of designing density and, and this idea of almost like a place of many places. So the key aspects, there's an economic side to it about space, but uh, by bringing all these entities together, you also create opportunities for different stakeholders looking after each of the facilities to start collaborating. Because you start with co-location, then uh, you start you allow them to start to co-share. So the concept of shared domains uh, starts to allow the adjacency to emerge as collaboration. So say 
my facilities of sports is located next to a medical center or health. So maybe what I can do is uh, from the sports sites to look at sports therapy, sports medicine, uh, to work with say a, a typical uh, GP. But what is very important for the residents and, and that's where design comes in, we co-located them at the same place. So for user, they just need to identify, oh, that's the place where we get, I get all the health and, and uh, wellness uh, kind of facilities. But for the stakeholders, they can co-create, say, some of the programs, the promotional events, and you start to identify that as a main cluster. So this is just uh, an example. So with that optimization comes the synergy of programs. Second key part about such integrated uh, community projects is uh, it talks about again this larger environmental benefit and because of the scale of some of this hub we bring in the context of streets of cities where your your plazas and squares are a part of the everyday space of the community so the larger engagement of this bigger environment but also because of the make it allows us to create uh, test beds for closed loop system so uh, like uh, in, in the context of our company's hub the solar panels of the stadium roof uh, powers the lighting of the car park and we have a huge food center. Uh, all the food waste are recycled and turned into fertilizer on site and reused at the rooftop gardens. So this entire closed loop and circular, almost micro uh, economic, a uh, circular economic setup allows us to push for a lot of ideas together with the community. And the last part, Again, anchoring back to the idea of, uh, of the so social dimension is uh, the social capital that it allows us to build. So again, our Tampanese hub and many of this hub are also examples of uh, maybe in our context, Singapore and many of the local agencies first foray into very active participatory design where there's very intentional attempts to work with the residents because we recognize that these are designed not just for the residents, but with and, and to some extent by the residents themselves, so that you can instill ownership and uh, stewardship that, that calls for long-term sustainable management and, and the way of how the residents can embrace this as part of their, their space. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's very, very fascinating. Yeah, because um, I'll just, I really like the idea of adjacency and sort of like thinking about how different sort of like um, buildings can relate to each other. And I think that will really help me with sort of like the, my projects in the future because um, I'm currently working on sort of like a, a residential building. And then I think next term I'm, I'll be moving forward onto like sort of larger scales and moving into production, sort of um, thinking about a larger community rather than just a resident. But, um, cool. Yeah, that was, that was, next that was time, nice. Jay, I promise, <laughs> at least to all the four of you, the next time you're in Singapore, I'll, I'll bring you guys around at least just to see <laughs> some of these places. Uh, Joe is in Singapore, Joel. Yeah, we can make that arrangement <laughs> at least to start. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, so final question um, is the, is the C word. So <laughs> uh, the, I was just wondering, how do you think that the current pandemic will sort of affect, do you think it will affect architecture in the future? Or do you think that is sort of like a blip in sort of like the history of architecture and you will just move on from it or do, will we learn from the pandemic and will that influence the architecture of the future? Mm, wow, this is like a, a very current topic and I, I do have some quite, uh, I'll say personal but quite deep uh, thoughts and feelings about it. But to put it simply, I think regardless of COVID, of the pandemic, at least in the context of architecture, it has always uh, been evolving. And uh, uh, as long as we follow that, that north light, our profession was made to work towards the betterment of society. All right. I think that's one of the, the key, uh, at least from the social cause dimension. All right. But that being said, of course, the current pandemic itself hastened some of this evolution in a good and bad way. All right, so of course there's two sides to the coin. And it also gave a certain uh, health check of where we are or what we have missed out along the way. 
uh, earlier I shared, you know, the term of, of not wasting a pandemic. And because uh, the pandemic raised several key uh, questions, I think fundamentally, at least from the design perspective, again, from larger scale, it looks at, at how, say, traditionally cities are designed, again, with the idea of uh, economic uh, impetus or focus as, as the center. All right, that's where the keynotes are designed, that's where people gather, density is built. But the pandemic has exposed a lot of these vulnerabilities of, of, of current settings. And uh, it reminded us uh, several key things uh, of uh, resilience, of health. So as I shared earlier, some of the key broad uh, questions, or rather I would say shift, that at least the pandemic has helped raise awareness is this notion of wealth to health. At least in the context of Singapore, uh, personally believe, and I can see that happening, uh, how the nation has a leverage on this particular situation is to hasten or accelerate two major transformation. And of course that will influence architecture itself. So first is uh, digitalization. Uh, because of the very uh, key need for us to work from home, it has triggered a whole series of, of change. Because of the need to telecommute, we will look at our setup infrastructurally. And that's why today's discussion is in this very platform. Because probably a year ago, you think that it's something that's not going to work. All right. So th the term Zoom, Teams, I mean, these are just common language now. I mean, we never talk about, oh, you're muted. I mean, it's never been a part of the language, but these are the everyday kind of lingos. And, and what it entails is uh, this, from this essential need, we start to look at uh, an alternate platform, and in this case, a digital platform, for us to ensure continuity in life and in practice. So in the concept of architectural practice, obviously, it hastened our transformation and digitalization of platforms, processes, and even our products. So that's one major change that has happened. And as, as I said, in the context of Singapore, uh, on a larger national and economic level, that's the current push. Next major change or shifts uh, was this uh, uh, something I touched on about the idea of wealth to health. And I also believe in many cities like ours, there will be uh, equal investment and of resources and investigation looking at uh, more adaptive, uh, more uh, flexible and more resilient organization structure of spaces from city level down to towns, down to uh, building and, and, and spatial levels. This is quite key because for us, to best build uh, our so-called, uh, our own case of vaccine against not just this, but future health crisis, is to build in that level of resilience within our physical infrastructure, right? And it talks about things uh, like moving away again from something that's always highly optimized to building uh, spaces with some level of flexibility this, lab, this idea, I call it a purposeful redundancy. So you know that space can be changed in terms of usage, right? And then this idea, uh, again, of, of uh, something that's highly reconfigurable uh, is, is quite key. So, and then of course, with, with uh, the development uh, of uh, our infrastructural kind of design uh, comes hand in hand with uh, the digital kind of space and infrastructure. So this itself, I believe will be that major change. But, but most important of all, I think what uh, the pandemic actually highlighted is the point on interconnectivity and interdependency. And I think it is actually reminding us of what's to come in terms of that larger crisis, which is about climate change and the loss of, of, of biodiversity uh, that are pending threats to all of us. And this discussion of, uh, of societal, of community health 
cannot be delinked from the discussion of the planetary health. So it's important that we do not lose sight of this larger crisis of uh, environmental, uh, of climate change and uh, environmental and ecosystem uh, degrad degradation. And, and it's also a very key moment that we leverage on this current situation to push for major structural change. I think one of the key things is the discussion about decarbonization. Uh, we need to capitalize on this to really push for such tangible change forward. Yeah. That's very fascinating because um, I think people were saying, oh, we hope we go back to normal. But I suppose normal was never good enough. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, cool. really fascinating thing. And um, I would love to continue this conversation one some other day. And perhaps maybe one day you could uh, give a talk to uh, the, the department if you would like to, if you have time. Um, I mean, we would love to have you here in, in Cambridge. <laughs> um, that's very so, kind, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, I have this um, supervision I have to go to. So I'm, I think I, might, I may have to leave first. But um, I think the others have more questions for you. But Thank you so much for your time. Um, okay. Um, really insightful. And um, yeah, thank you. Take good care, yeah, Jay. I hope we'll catch up with you again. Yeah. Thank and, you so and much. Hope that our path will cross. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Stay well. I think that discussion was really, really fruitful. Um, so I'm glad uh, sort of all those questions came about. Um, and so, well, now it's just a, a matter of bringing this to, to a close, but before we we just have one question which we'd like to ask sort of every everyone that comes on here and that's if you had one piece of advice for the youth what would it be okay uh i'll share one of these quotes that really inspired me and it's a uh, by a fellow you know, architect uh, mushi sapi when i read it i was i just thought it's really powerful seek the truth and beauty shall emerge and i think it has somewhat be a kind of guiding advice always at the back of my mind and and uh, I, I share about that kind of uh, the north light it's very important to always remind ourselves uh, the center and the very reason why we are in this profession and pursuing this vocation and i hope that's something that uh, everyone not just the youth uh, can also find their own kind of space and anchor Thanks for listening in. This podcast has been brought to you by Desera, a platform designed to bridge the gap between the youth and profession. You can read more about us at desera.org. And you can also check out the section titled Insights with Experts, where you can submit your questions that you might have for future experts and industries that you would like to learn more about. And you can also refer in any experts that you might know yourself.